This is a conflict that goes back to the late 1980s, uh, to the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the different republics were becoming independent from Soviet rule. Azerbaijan, one of them, uh, and a, a small area uh, inhabited by a local ethnic Armenian majority wanted to break away from Azerbaijan. Uh, there was a, a very uh, vicious war in the early 90s, which Armenians won uh, and uh, basically took control not only of Nagorno Karabakh, but the surrounding areas, um, uh, causing uh, uh, massive waves of forced displacement of Azerbaijanis. And that situation has basically persisted through the intervening decades. There was a, a second major war in 2020 that was won by Azerbaijan. Uh, and uh, it was nevertheless an incomplete victory. Part of this Nagorno-Karabakh entity remained outside of Azerbaijani control, supervised by Russian peacekeepers. And what we've seen this week is the final dissolution of this last kind of anomaly beyond Azerbaijani sovereignty. Uh, so this is really about Azerbaijan sort of restoring its territorial integrity, uh, but doing so in ways that have been extremely coercive, resulting in very severe humanitarian and human rights issues. Yes, and I want to get to that in a moment, but let's talk about the Russian peacekeepers and potentially the role that they have played in what some people see as almost an, an exercise of ethnic cleansing. Yes, uh, uh, so you, you've got uh, roughly 2,000 uh, Russian peacekeepers uh, were stationed in Karabakh uh, in 2020. Uh, but already uh, within the first year, uh, there have been uh, multiple repeated uh, ceasefire violations, escalations, and so on. Then Russia invaded Ukraine, and that dramatically debilitated its capacity uh, to act as a security guarantor, as a sec security patron in the South Caucasus. Um, and we've seen increased uh, ceasefire issues, major escalations, uh, and so on over the last uh, year and a half. Um, and I think in, in this uh, particular episode, what we've seen is basically uh, peacekeepers as bystanders. Uh, even a number of them have been killed uh, as a result uh, of the Azerbaijani offensive. And so there's really very little sense that they have acted as, a, as a, any kind of security guarantee. Um, uh, and indeed, Russia's reputation as a security patron and peacekeeper uh, is, is in tatters. Yeah. When you talk about this sort of being the final chapter, uh, <clears throat> what is that going to look like for those ethnic Armenians still living within this enclave? Well, we're talking about a number roughly up to about 100,000 people. And one of the terms of yesterday's ceasefire was the opening of discussions on integration or reintegration as Azerbaijan sees it. Uh, this has been framed as uh, basically a package of rights uh, that would make Karabakh Armenians just another minority uh, alongside other minorities in Azerbaijan. Uh, so they would have you know, native language uh, use, uh, rights to education uh, and so on. Um, but I think the key issue is how credible these commitments are and what would be the underlying security guarantees uh, in this particular case? So I think you've got, you know, what you could call a credible commitment problem. Uh, in, you know, it's very difficult to reintegrate a population that has been under blockade for nine months and has now been, you know, targeted uh, in uh, in military action. So I think probably the most likely outcome that we're going to see in the coming weeks and months is an outflow of people. Uh, from uh, from the territory uh, into the Republic of Armenia. Yeah, and with that blockade, there's been considerable problems in terms of food shortages, medical shortages, and of course th the treatment for, of them day to day. Yes, absolutely. Uh, initially, uh, so the, the, the blockade began in December uh, of last year. It began initially as a kind of a, a, a protest by eco-activists uh, who were operating with Azerbaijani government support, protesting the use of, of uh, exploitation of natural resources in Karabakh itself. And I think a lot of people thought at that time this was immediately going to cause a humanitarian crisis. But it resulted in a more or less manageable situation with the Red Cross and Russian peacekeepers able to keep essential supplies going along this Larchin corridor. This is this passage that connects Karabakh uh, and Armenia. 
But from mid-June, the blockade became a more total blockade. And Azerbaijan has been calling for an alternative route that would connect Karabakh not to Armenia, but to central uh, Azerbaijan. And there were very intense uh, negotiations around this. And finally, these two roads uh, were opened uh, just days prior to uh, the escalation of violence uh, this week. So we are talking about a population that has been you know, suffering from hunger, uh, an absence of medicine, an absence of basic uh, health care, uh, that is now uh, in, in large numbers forcibly displaced and in a, a condition of really uh, very great distress. Uh, so I think you know, international uh, action is needed uh, urgently uh, to prevent further human disaster from happening. Yeah, and, and that's to your point where things are so complicated given the strain um, on so many resources because of the war in Ukraine. Uh, with this inevitability that you talk up potentially of this outflow of people, do you think the Armenian government is, is open to accepting these people, rehousing them, resettling them? Uh, well, historically, you know, there have been previous waves of uh, Armenians displaced from Azerbaijan in the first conflict, and their treatment uh, in, in Armenia was, was very far from ideal. Uh, I think there are serious questions about the capacity uh, of the Republic of Armenia to, to receive people. Um, but I think the other issue that we really need to be conscious of is that uh, any outflow of Karabakh Armenians would be coming into the southern province of Armenia, known as Sunik. And this has also been a site of ceasefire violations, Azerbaijani incursions, um, and so on in recent months. So in a way, Karabakh Armenians moving from Karabakh into Armenia wouldn't be moving into a safe space necessarily. Uh, now, the European Union does have a monitoring mission uh, along the border uh, of Sunik, uh, that is monitoring the border with Azerbaijan. But I think we would need uh, a substantially increased uh, international presence, uh, humanitarian support presence to really deal uh, with this outflow of people, yeah. should it happen.